Good afternoon. This is the lab recording to go along with exercise 9, the axial skeleton. So in this we're going to go through first the bones of the skull. We'll then look at the vertebrae and the thoracic cage or the ribs. So let's begin with the skull. I'm going to start off with this nice skull model here and basically I'm just going to run through some of the different bones and then what I'll do is I will use a disarticulating skull where I'll actually take the bones apart so you can see them individually for the most part. So we'll start off with the cranial bones. The cranial bones are the bones that make up the case of the cranium that surrounds the brain. Right? So the front bone here that forms the top or the superior um, margins of the orbit of the eye is the frontal bone. The frontal bone articulates with the two side bones or parietal bones at the suture here, okay, which is called the coronal suture, right, also known as the frontal suture. The two side bones that form the top portion of the cranium, these are the parietal bones. The very back part of the skull, this is the occipital bone. The occipital bone forms the lamboid suture here with the two parietal bones. Now if we take a look at the occipital bone, the occipital bone has some very important structures. So we have this large opening, this is the magnum foramen or the foramen magnum. Foramen means an opening and magnum means largest. What passes through here would be the spinal cord. Right? There are also these two rounded condyles here and these are called the occipital condyles and the occipital condyles will sit on part of the vertebrae, the top of vertebrae called C1 which is also called the atlas. Now the other bones on the side here, these are the temporal bones, there's one on each side. The temporal bone has a few very important structures. One is this opening, I'm just kind of sticking my finger in it. That opening there is called the external acoustic meatus. That external acoustic meatus is going to be where you have the opening that goes for the ear. Also then coming off, you have this process coming off, and this is called the zygomatic process. The zygomatic process is going to be continuous and it's going to articulate with a bone that we'll see in the facial bone. So it's going to form part of the cheekbone. Right? There's also this very large um, kind of bumpy portion over here, right? and that is called the mastoid process. Now the other two cranial bones are harder to see when we have the skull intact. Um, the ethmoid bone is located up in between the two orbits of the eye. The best way to see these bones is actually to remove the top of the skull and look at the skull from the interior view. So now I'm looking at the interior view and you see this region here, right? you see these part that come out and kind of look like wings. That's part of what's called the sphenoid bone. And then right here is a little bit sticking up, it's a little bump sticking up here. That is called the Christogaly of the ethmoid bone. So the sphenoid bone and the ethmoid bone, you really can't see intact skulls. All right? They are kind of um, almost hidden. What will be important is when we take a look at the sphenoid bone separately, the sphenoid bone has uh, an important structure in it called the optic canal. And the optic canal is where the optic nerve passes through. And I'm actually going to pass a pointer through. See the metal pointer passing through? Okay, The optic nerve is the nerve that passes from the eye. So if you imagine that there is an opening at the very back of the socket of the eye, or the orbit of the eye, that the nerve passes through, that's where it would pass to. And that is how the um, the cranial, uh, the sorry, that is how the optic nerve passes back into the brain. So you can just make out that metal portion. Now, the other important bones in the skull are the facial bones. Right? So the facial bones make up the face. They are for the most part paired. The two exceptions, the two unpaired bones, are the lower jaw, which is called the mandible. Okay? The mandible is unpaired, there's just one mandible. Also here, making up part of the septum of the nose is a plow-shaped bone called the vomer, and that is unpaired. The rest of these will be paired, so we'll just look at one side. Right? The bone that makes up the apple of the cheek, or the round part of the cheek, Okay. That is called the zygomatic bone. So the zygomatic process of the temporal bone articulates with the zygomatic bone and it forms this structure here called the zygomatic arch. Okay. And when you take a look at the zygomatic arch, you can see it is an arch and that's what forms the cheek. Now the zygomatic bone is going to articulate in some portions with the frontal bone, which is a cranial bone, but then also with the bone that forms the upper jaw, which is called the maxilla. Right? So the maxilla is going to form the majority of the upper jaw and part of the bridge of the nose. The 
front of the bridge of the nose is going to be formed by two tiny paired bones called the nasal bones. Um, inside the very very point at the orbit of the eye where we have the tear ducts, there's a little duct there. That's where the lacrimal duct is, and that's called the lacrimal bone. The other bones are more internal. Right? We can take a look, and if we look at the back of the hard palate, the front portion, the front portion of the hard palate of the mouth is formed by the maxilla. The very back portion is formed by the palatine bone. The other bone is called the inferior nasal conche, and that bone is nearly impossible to see in intact skull. It forms the lower portion of the nasal passageway. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this skull that's called a disarticulating skull. So as I go through the bones, I can actually take them apart. Now when we see this intact, it doesn't sit as nicely as the other ones, but it does give us a chance to see those bones kind of separately. All right, so we'll just quickly review. Um, and I won't necessarily do these in the same order I did previously. I'll do them in the order that they best disarticulate. So we'll actually start with the facial bones. So I'm going to remove these bones, and the first bone I will remove is the mandible. And so here is the mandible. There are these two rounded condyles here called the mandibular condyles. And these mandibular condyles are going to sit in a fossa that we will see on the temporal bone. This is where we would have the teeth, and the teeth sit in something called the alveolar margin. Now returning to the skull, we can then remove the main structure of what we would consider to be the face. I'll start off by removing the zygomatic bones. When I remove the zygomatic bones, you see these bones have a very odd shape to them, fairly small. Um, and the key structure is you can see this rounded portion here that forms the outermost portion of the socket of the eye, the what's called the orbit of the eye. And what we would consider the apple of the cheek or the prominence of the cheek would be right here. From there, I'm then going to remove this portion right here. Um, and this portion is going to show us several bones together. So here we have the paired maxilla. Now when I separate these maxilla, we're going to be able to see a few different bones here. I'm actually going to switch to a colored model so that we can see the differentiation between these bones. But I'm going to run through them on this actual bone colored model first. So this would be the maxilla itself. We have the process that articulates with the zygomatic bone. This is the process that goes up and forms the, the this is called the frontal process because it goes up to the frontal bone. Um, we have the region that forms the hard palate. Right, that would be the palatine process. Here is that bone that is called the inferior nasal conche bone. The nasal bone would be here. The lacrimal bone would be here. And then finally the palatine bone would be right along the back and forms part of the hard palate as well. And I'm just going to switch for a moment to a colored model for that so you can see the differentiation a little bit better. So on this colored model, now please remember the bones are not actually colored, this just helps to differentiate. The purple is what would be the actual maxilla. Shown here in this light orange color, that is going to be the lacrimal bone. The yellowish flesh tone would be um, the nasal bone. Then turning to the inside, here again you can see the lacrimal bone. This is the inferior nasal conche bone. And then along the back, the palatine bone. So it just gives you another view of that. The last facial bone we need to look at would be the vomer. And I've left the vomer in place up until this point. So you can see the vomer sits right in the middle. It forms part of the septum of the nose. And the septum separates the nostrils into the left and right half. And this is the vomer. It's a fairly thin bone, roughly triangular in shape. So what we're left with now is what we would consider the cranium. So we have this enclosed space that would protect the brain. These gaps here are just because of the model. So we'll run through these. Let me start off with the ones we weren't able to see well in the intact one. The first one is this right here. This would be the ethmoid bone. So if we put the face back in, remove the face right behind the face, right behind the facial bones is where we would have the ethmoid bone. Now this plastic model doesn't do the ethmoid bone justice. The ethmoid bone is an extremely delicate bone. The majority of the bone is actually made of um, sinuses. Sinuses are space within bones. So this is actually an extremely fragile, very, very thin bone. Some of the main structures are this point that sits up right here. Okay, This is called the Christigalli. This actually sticks up into the brain case where you have the brain sitting. And we're going to see one of the meninges actually attaches there. 
The other part is if you look at these flattened regions, they would have very tiny holes in them, and those are called olfactory foramina. That plate is called the cribriform plate, and those olfactory foramina are very important where the neurons for scent or olfaction pass through. The other thing that we have is we have what's called the perpendicular plate, which is running straight up and down, and that forms the top part of the septum of the nose. And then we have these two parts that kind of wing out, and those are the superior nasal conchae, and those will be important in forming the lateral walls of the nasal passageway. The next bone that was not really able to be seen very clearly is the sphenoid bone. Now that I've removed the facial structures and I've removed the ethmoid bone, the sphenoid bone becomes very clear. The sphenoid bone actually articulates with all of the other cranial bones. So it articulated with the ethmoid bone, which I've removed. It articulates with the frontal bone, the temporal bones, the parietal bone, and the occipital bone. So this forms basically a wedge that's kind of the center of the entirety of the cranium. It's a very unique bone. Um, it has this roughly bat shape <laughs> where it has what are called the greater wings and the lesser wings. It also has these processes down here. Okay? These processes are called the pterygoid processes, and these actually sit at the very back of the maxilla and form the very, very back region of the upper jaw. As I showed you earlier, there is the optic canal, and the optic canal is where the optic nerve passes through, and you can see it a bit more clearly now when I have the bone disarticulated, that that would be how this would sit in the actual socket. Right. There is a little dip here, and that little dip here is where you would have the optic nerve sitting as it crosses and goes back to the rest of the brain. The other main bones are much simpler to see, so we have the frontal bone, which I've removed. The key structures here are these regions where we have the superior orbital margins that form um, the top of the socket of the eye. So if you take a look at this bone, it actually has almost a cup shape to it. Then we have the two parietal bones, and the parietal bones together form the arch or the dome of the skull, but each one separately is just roughly curved, right? So these are pretty much flat with just a slight curve to them. Then we have the much more complex temporal bone. So the temporal bone, I pointed out most of the structures. This would be the zygomatic process, the external acoustic meatus, the mastoid process. Right? This very thin region here, this is the squamous region. And that squamous region is going to articulate with the parietal bone at the squamosal suture. And then finally, the occipital bone. The occipital bone, the main structure here is the magnum foramen, or the foramen magnum, as well as the occipital condyles. So that's the overview of the skull. The overview of the skull coincides with the lab book, um, the first activity, activity one. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at the next activities, and we're going to look at the vertebral column. So we're going to look at the individual vertebrae first. So when looking at the vertebrae, remember the vertebrae, the importance of the vertebrae is to protect the spinal cord. Right? The numbers of vertebrae that we have, um, the first kind of vertebrae we have are called the cervical vertebrae, and we have seven cervical vertebrae. The cervical vertebrae stand out because they have transverse foramina, and those transverse foramina are openings on the sides, right? So all vertebrae have certain structures. They all have a body. Right? They all have a spinous process. They all have a vertebral foramen. That's where the spinal cord would go. The cervical vertebrae are unique because they also have these two additional foramen called the transverse foramen. Now, the first two of the cervical vertebrae have special names. The first one is called the atlas. Right? This is the atlas. The atlas lacks a true body. Instead, it has two articular surfaces. Those are going to articulate with the occipital condyles of the skull. And so this is what's going to allow us to have this forward and back nod or head movement. C2, or the second cervical vertebrae, is called the axis. And what's unique here is coming off the body, we have this clear projection, and that projection is called the dens. Now what this allows to happen is it allows the atlas to sit on the axis and actually do side to side rotation to shake your head no. So those are C1 and C2. The remaining cervical vertebrae have spinous processes of various lengths, but most of them have some bifurcation. And that's going to allow the cervical vertebrae allow you to roll your neck 
back. So if you want to follow along with the lab book at this point, we are looking at figure 9.14. Okay, that shows us the first and second cervical vertebrae. Right? And then we're going to be looking at figure 19, I'm sorry, 9.15 or 9.15. That's just going to be the overview. You will not have to be able to recognize all of the vertebrae, but you should be able to recognize any vertebrae and know if it is cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. Right? So those are the cervical. The next kind are the thoracic. The thoracic, there are 12, and these would be located in the region of the thorax, or the rib cage. So this is a typical thoracic vertebrae. It does have a body. It does have a spinous process. It does have a vertebral foramen. Um, the spinous process here is very long and extended. Students have told me before that this looks like a giraffe face to them, if that helps you at all. Um, what these have, these have facets in their transverse process, they have facets where the ribs will articulate. So there's a little dip on each of these facets here and here that allows the ribs to articulate. It's harder to see in a disarticulated vertebra. When we look at the entire skeleton, this will be more clear. The last type are the lumbar. The lumbars are much thicker. Okay? The lumbars have a very thick, heavy body, a more triangular vertebral foramen. They have a fairly short and blunt um, spinous process. When we take a look at these, these are a variable size. But one of the things that stands out with all of the lumbar vertebrae right, is that they have articular surfaces that go more side to side. Right? So these allow for rolling, but not twisting side to side movements. Now the final portion of the vertebral column is the sacrum. Right? And the sacrum, we have the fused vertebra. Right? The fused vertebra have an opening here. Right? At this point, we no longer have a solid nerve cord. Um, now we have what's called the cauda equina, and we'll see that more in depth in later chapters. So this would be the sacrum. And as we'll see in the next lab, the sacrum is actually going to articulate here and here with the bones of the hip to create the pelvic girdle. Now the ribs themselves, the ribs are part of the thoracic cage. Right? And you will not need to be able to identify individual ribs, but you should take a look at the main shape of a rib. So ribs have a curved shape. Right? They have a blunt end. Right? Depending on the type of the rib, that blunt end will either articulate with cartilage, um, then the sternum, or will articulate through a two-step cartilage. Right? Then on their more um, complex side, this is where they would articulate with the vertebrae. So they have two facets that would sit on a thoracic vertebrae, right? and then these would come around and form the rib cage. So to make this a little bit more clear, I'm going to bring over a fully articulated skeleton. So if we take a look, this is the thoracic cage. Right? The front part here, this is the sternum of the breastbone. The sternum really has three parts, the manubrium, the body, and then this is called the xiphoid process. When we take a look at the vertebrae, I'm going to turn this around so we see the vertebral column. The cervical, 1 through 7, are here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. You can see that each of these has um, spinous processes of various lengths. Um, the articulation allows the skull to sit on the vertebral column. Then we have T1 through T12, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. These have ribs articulating with them, so here you can see the ribs articulating. The rib cages, the rib cage is formed by the attachment of the ribs in the back to the vertebrae, and then for some of the ribs they attach up front. So the ribs that attach from vertebrae directly to the sternum through a single piece of cartilage called costal cartilage. These are the true ribs or the vertebral sternal ribs. Then we have these three ribs over here and these three ribs connect to this central piece of cartilage. Right? So these are called the vertebral chondral ribs and these are referred to as the false ribs. The final two ribs are the floating ribs and these ribs are also referred to as just the vertebral ribs because they only attach the body at the vertebrae. Down over here, they do not attach to the front. These provide a little bit of additional protection for some of our organs, especially our kidneys. 
if we take a look at the very back below the thoracics we have the lumbar so the lumbar would be the curve of the um, the lower back or the lumbar back and then we have the sacrum and the sacrum articulates with the bones of the hip and that will be looked at more in depth in the appendicular section so that is an overview of the exercise for the axial skeleton thank you